To those of you who are joining us on YouTube, Facebook, or through our fpcbranson.com website, welcome. Let's worship the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you asking for your spirit of worship to be poured out upon us. Whether we're alone at home or with a few people, we ask God that you would make this a time when we get to be the church, not do church, but be the church as we come together with you. Father, fill our hearts with gratitude for all of your good gifts, confidence in your sovereign oversight of how we make it through the uh, pandemic that we're experiencing, that we would be able to trust loved ones that we can't be with into your care. And that Father, right now, we would have hearts filled with peace as we worship you. Amen. This morning we will open with a hymn, uh, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart. Uh, we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4 this morning. This morning, as we continue in worship, would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your great power and your love. God, thank you for your presence that you pour out on us this morning. Lord, we ask that as we worship together as a family, as we worship together um, with uh, our neighbors, maybe as we worship maybe by ourselves, Lord, that we would sense your spirit. Lord, as we hear your word read and preached and prayed, and as we meditate on it, we ask, God, that you would speak to us. Speak through the power of your word. Lord, there are a, a host of needs that uh, we all experience right now, Lord, and we bring them to you. Uh, Lord, we ask for provision financial provision, um, provision in our health, provision in our families, Lord, provision in our church, in our places of work. Lord, remind us that you are our provider, provide for us in a mighty way. And even when we offer prayers and they go unanswered or we don't see the answer we're looking for, help us to trust you. Lord, for our uh, our government, uh, federal, 
state and local, provide wisdom and power to those who serve us. For our first responders, those working in gas stations, in uh, grocery stores, uh, in other uh, public areas, God, prov provide for them and protect them. Lord, give us wisdom as we long to meet together again in worship. For all these things, Lord, we look to you. We trust you, our Father who loves us more than we'll ever understand. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. have the support of church family easily accessible, it may be more important than ever for us to have some idea of how God answers prayer. And I'm going to share with you this morning five ways at least 
that God answers prayer. But first, let me tell you a short story. It was of a girl of faith who was praying that God would give her a pony. And she told a friend of hers who was unchurched about this prayer. And he was eagerly following to see what would happen. Well, along came her birthday, no pony. And the friend came up to her maybe a little bit teasingly and said, so God didn't answer your prayer. And the girl said, he did too. He just said, no. <laughs> Often, we don't really know what an answer to prayer might look like or from where it will come. But the scripture gives us some clues. And I want to share some of that with you. There are these five ways that we see God answering prayer in the Bible is mostly taken from the Dunamis Project, a series of six workshops. And this particularly comes from the third workshop, workshop on the power of prayer. The five ways that God answers prayer are these. Through the control of nature, through angels, through providential control of human history, through outpourings of the Holy Spirit, through God's people who listen and obey. And I'm going to show you an example in Scripture of each of these, or talk about an example in Scripture, and also try to show you some examples from present day or recent events of how God works to answer prayer in these five ways. The first one, God answers prayer through control or manipulation of nature. In 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 through 6, it says this, Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by Kirith Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Kirith Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. So here we see Elijah, a prophet, a man of prayer, telling wicked King Ahab that he was going to pray and God would shut down rain entirely and bring about a drought. And in order for Elijah to be able to live, God told him to camp by this brook and that he would have the birds, the ravens, bring him food each morning and each evening. And ravens are known as scavengers that will grab things and fly off with them. But here, apparently, God was directing the ravens to grab good food, meat and bread, and bring it to Elijah each morning and evening. So we see prayer being answered in part through the creation, God's oversight of creation. But a little bit later, in 1 Kings 18, looking at verses 42 to 45, we're now after this contest between Ahab and Jezebel and the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asheroth, whom Jezebel worshipped, Baal, whom Ahab had started to worship, and Elijah. They go up on the mountain, and it's been three years since it last rained. They build two altars. They put wood on the altars. They put a calf on each altar. And then Elijah says to the prophets of Baal and Asherah, get your God to bring down fire and burn up your offering. They do all kinds of crazy stuff, but nothing happens. So then Elijah says, I want you to take water from big jars and pour it over the altar. And he had dug a trench around the altar that would hold several gallons of water. And he said, now douse it a second time and douse it a third time until the offering meet, the wood on the altar, the stone of the altar, the sand around the altar, and the trench were all soaking wet. And then he prayed to God, and he asked God to send down fire, and God did send fire, which burned up the offering, burned up the wood, burned up the stones of the altar, burned up the dust and sand around it, and all of the water in the trench. At which point they took all of the prophets of uh, Asherah and Baal down into the Kidron Valley and killed them. God had proven who was truly God. Well, we pick up after that and we read this. So Ahab went to eat and drink. 
This is the evil King Ahab has left. But Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. And from Mount Carmel, the sea can be seen up north and a little bit to the west from the top of that mountain. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I don't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time, his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb in your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. And soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. So here we see how the man of God, Elijah prays and a drought begins. Then he prays and the drought ends. So God in control of nature directly answering prayers. Now, a good question to ask is, do we have a similar authority over nature that was given to Elijah, for instance? Once in prayer up on a mountain, Brad Long, the executive director of PRMI, who bring us dunamis materials, such as what we're working from here, asked God if we as Christians had the same authority over nature that Jesus exercised. God's answer, yes, you do, but only as it is necessary to fulfill my purposes. So God can give us control over nature, but it's not just ours to wield for our own entertainment or pleasure. Once at a large outdoor teaching and worship event for students in Washington, DC, the leadership started hearing reports of a weather system moving toward their location, which included severe weather warnings. There were something like 10,000 plus students sitting outdoors, listening to speakers and participating in prayer and worship. And the leadership of the event went into intense intercession. They asked God to either tell them to evacuate the students or to change the weather. They did not hear a call to evacuate from the Lord, but after a while they did hear that the storm system seemed to have split into two separate storm systems, one of which went to the north of their location and the other to the south while they remain dry. So perhaps that's an example of the intense intercessory prayer of those leaders, and they got the students involved as well, causing a change in creation and answer to prayer. Second way that we see God answering prayer in the Bible is in Acts 12, one through 10, and this through angels. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the prison cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him. And just to interject, I don't think he kicked him or anything. I picture this more like a bit of a gib slap. Come on, Peter, wake up. We got to go. So the angel wakens him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, get dressed, put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed first and second guard posts, came to an iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and then the angel suddenly left him. Peter hardly knew what to make of this. He suddenly realized it wasn't a vision, that he actually was standing outside of the prison. And one question that occurs to me is, why is it that Peter was spared? Why was it that the same kind of protection 
wasn't provided to John. And I suspect, given the text, that John's uh, being killed took the church by surprise and was a real wake-up call. So that when later Peter was arrested, it says the church was fervently praying for him. And how did God answer the church's prayer? And I'm sure Peter's prayers through an angel. And why an angel? Well, sometimes it seems that when the answer to prayer involves the material world, like chains on wrists and gates on prisons, that God uses angels who are messengers created to interface between the spirit realm and the world in which we live. But that's just speculation on my part. What we know is that God uses angels. My wife has a story you may have heard driving along on a highway late at night on her way home from work. She suddenly heard a voice. She doesn't know if it was out loud or in her mind, but she heard a voice saying, pull over to the side of the road. And she thought that was crazy. She heard it again. So she reluctantly pulled over to the side of the road and slowed down. And as she did, she had a tire blow out. There's almost no side on this portion of this highway in New Jersey, just barely enough room for a vehicle. So she pulled over and she didn't know what to do. This was before she would carry a cell phone or anything. When suddenly lights came on behind her, yellow lights, there was a tow truck and the driver with the tow truck got out and changed her tire, putting the spare on for her. She tried to pay him. He wouldn't take any money. So she went, put the tire away. He put the tire away in the back of her car for her. She went to get into the car, turned around to look for him. He and the truck were gone. She still doesn't know how they managed to get out without her noticing it. If in fact it was a person in a truck and not an angel sent to help her. The third way God answers prayer is through providential control of human history. And this is really interesting and exciting, both in the Bible and also in today, in the present time. In Isaiah 44, 24a and 28, it says this. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer and Creator. I am the Lord who made all things. When I say of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he will certainly do as I say. He will command, rebuild Jerusalem. He will say, restore the temple. Now, why is this such a remarkable thing to hear from God? Because Cyrus was the king over the Babylonian empire and Israel had been captives to Babylon for 70 years. But Cyrus was God's shepherd who would send Nehemiah and all the resources needed to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and God's temple in Jerusalem. So God was using King Cyrus to accomplish his purposes. Now, the Babylonian Empire was centered around the city of Babel, which is somewhere near present-day uh, Baghdad in Iraq, we believe. Just to the east, on the other side of the Gulf, is Iran. And in Iran, we can see God sovereignly at work through human history. And I think that's really fascinating. According to one commentator on a CBN interview, after almost 40 years of the Islamic regime, the average Iranian is realizing that Islam is bankrupt and the Islam is not the answer to their social daily lives and the dilemmas they're dealing with. Iran is facing a host of crises from drug addiction to depression to suicide to sexually transmitted diseases to human trafficking. Unfortunately, Iran is dealing with so many issues and the answers are not found within state religion. According to a documentary, Sheep Among Wolves, Volume 2, people in Iran, a Muslim-majority nation, are fleeing Islam in droves as believers bow their knees to Jesus. What if I told you Islam is dead? One identified Iranian church leader says in the film, what if I told you the mosques are empty inside Iran, he continues. What if I told you no one follows Islam inside of Iran? Would you believe me? This is exactly what is happening inside of Iran. God is moving powerfully inside of Iran. The pastor adds, what if I told you that the best evangelist for Jesus 
was the Ayatollah Khomeini. The Ayatollahs brought the true face of Islam to light, and people discovered that it wasn't the truth. After 40 years under Islamic law, a utopia, according to them, they've had the worst devastation in the 5,000-year history of Iran. And Iran today, which has almost no formal churches in existence, they were all closed down 40 years ago. No missionaries allowed to enter. It's against the law for Muslims to convert to Christianity. And it is viewed as the largest and fast, it's the fastest growing church in any nation in the world. So it's a persecuted underground home church growth, but it's the fastest growing segment of the church in any nation in the world. And God was able to use even the Ayatollahs and this Islamic leadership in the last 40 years to lead people to Christ. The fourth way that God answers prayer is through outpourings of the Holy Spirit. In Acts uh, chapter 4, verses 16 through 31, we read of the leaders in Jerusalem saying, what should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they performed a miraculous sign, and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak to or teach in the name of Jesus. Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we've seen and heard. The council threatened them further, but then finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. As soon as they were free, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, creator of heaven, earth and sea and everything in them. You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O Lord, Hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the place, the meeting place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they preached the word of God with boldness. Under threat of torture or death, they prayed for the courage to preach with yet more boldness and to see yet more miraculous signs and wonders to convince people that Jesus is Lord. The last way that we see God, oh, in, in present day, one story that particularly struck me was of John Wimber, a pastor who had the Holy Spirit show up one Sunday morning unexpectedly in his church service. And the one hour service turned into a two and a half hour service. And people were confessing sins and being reconciled to each other and prophesying to each other and laying hands on and being healed by each other and speaking in tongues and falling down on the ground and just spending time hanging out with the Lord. And about half the people from his church got really upset and left. The other half had an experience they weren't prepared for. And he prayed all night, God, what do I say about this? What do I say? Went through his books and the scriptures. About 6 a.m. the next morning, a friend of his called and said, John, I don't know what is going on, but God woke me up and told me I had to call you and say this, John, it's me. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit became the start of what would become the Vineyard Movement, something in the second wave of the Holy Spirit's work in the middle of the 20th century it became eventually an international denomination, the Vineyard Movement. And it all started with the Holy Spirit showing up and kind of wrecking what they expected to see happen on Sunday morning in a regular church service. 
The fifth way that God answers prayer is through God's people who listen and obey. And I want you to pay attention because this is perhaps the most common way that God answers our prayers is through us. An angel, we're told in Acts, came to Cornelius, a Roman military leader, and told him to send for a person named Peter, who had been Saul, or Paul, Peter, who had been Silas, who was in Joppa. That's 35, 40 miles south of where he was. And so he believes God. He's a godly man from a godly household. And he goes ahead and sends two servants and a faithful military leader of his. And the three men travel all day. I don't know if you ever tried to walk 35 or 40 miles in a day, but they did. Down to find this Peter that he spoke of. In a vision at the same time, God shows Peter a vision that was basically telling him to break the Jewish restrictions on eating what were considered unclean kinds of food. And Peter sort of argues a bit with the Lord, but he accepts what God was telling him. Then these men show up at the house where he's staying, and the Holy Spirit says, you're to go with them without hesitation. So they said, Cornelius, our master, has sent for you. Peter says, I'm here, I'm ready to go, and he leaves with them. They travel The next morning, they travel all day and get back up to uh, where Cornelius lives. And he and his whole household were eagerly awaiting them. And Peter explained to him the gospel. And it seems like the whole household, and this would have been a lot of people, not just a wife and a son or daughter, but all of the servants and all of those he commanded around him came to the Lord. This was the beginning of outreach beyond the Jews to the Gentiles. And God brought it to pass through Cornelius, a godly Gentile, and Peter, a godly Jew, who both listened and obeyed. Some of you have heard me tell the story of a time when God told me to do something that sounded to me ridiculous. He said, as I was in prayer with a group of people, that I was supposed to pray for healing for leprosy for Ida Jane. I didn't really know Ida Jane. She certainly didn't look like a leper. I thought that was very absurd. And of course, my primary concerns in that moment were that I would look foolish, that this would hurt my reputation. So my motivations were fear, pride, and they were pretty much born out of ignorance because I had never before heard the voice of God speaking to me in such a way. I did eventually realize that this was God speaking, that in fact, the voice that said to me, pray for healing for Ida Jane from leprosy, was the God who had called creation into being. And with effort, I set aside my pride and my fear and in an awkward way, went ahead and said the words he told me to say. And a great relief flooded through me as I completed the obedience. And what's more, turns out Ida Jane had a condition where her fingertips, if exposed to the cold, would turn white and could very quickly succumb to frostbite. It's a medical, known medical condition. And we were in Lake George in February. If you don't know Lake George in New York, it gets pretty cold in February. There was snow about a foot deep on the ground, temperatures dropping down into the teens at night. And the problem that Ida Jane had with her fingers completely ceased, all except for the tip of one pinky. Now, the fact that it was a circulatory problem with the extremities, that sounds a little bit like what happens with leprosy. But I think what God was interested in was two things, blessing I to Jane and teaching me obedience. And because, as imperfectly as I did, I obeyed, God answered the prayer that I to Jane would be healed. So how does God answer prayer? Through control of nature, through angels, through providential control of human history, through outpourings of the Holy Spirit, but most of all, through you and through me. If we'll just listen, he will answer. Father, we ask that you would teach us 
to watch in unexpected places and from unexpected directions for your answers to prayer. Believing that even though you don't always answer the way we expect, you always hear and answer our prayers. Amen. Today we will be closing our worship uh, by singing All the Way My Savior Leads Me, uh, all three verses this morning. May the God who answers all of our prayers teach us how to pray and how to see the answers to those prayers. To you be power in your prayer life now and always. Amen. Amen.